Danny loves football. He's got a blinding left kick on him. When I look at him, I see the curly hair and this big grin. And yeah, he worms his way into your heart. Who's this, Danny? No. What's your name? Da. What's your name? Da. <laughs> no, it's not. What's your name? Tired, Baba. Yeah, you're tired. Look, there's you with Daisy. <laughs> Is that what you think? No, oh, that was a nice day. I was always telling myself not to, not to be worried, not to, not to be paranoid about things, and he was just a bit behind, and he'd catch up. That my mum and sister, they were both concerned as well. So I went to a speech and language drop-in, and the second appointment we have had with him, he gave us the results of the test and said it's all been negative so far, which is great. And then came the butt. And he pulled up on his computer photos of some other children and said, I think you need to look at these. They seem similar to Danny. I didn't even tell Craig to start with what the diagnosis meant. That was a difficult conversation. Craig said, so what's the worst that could happen? And then I had to tell him <laughs> the worst that could happen would be that Danny dies when he's 10. So MPS2 is what's called a lysosomal storage disease, and it's inherited from your parents. It is the lack of an enzyme. This would usually break down uh, long chain sugars, which would normally be recycling within our cells in order to reuse the component parts. Sometimes people use the analogy of rubbish. So there's all sorts of rubbish building up in the body, and every so often the bin lorry comes around, takes it all away. In Hunter's syndrome, that bin lorry, the enzyme, is missing. Everybody with MPS2 will have an enlarged liver and spleen, so have a big tummy. They would typically have problems with bones and joints, and you'll see manifestation of, in the bones of the face as well. And they will also uh, often have uh, behavioral problems. They will often start losing their developmental milestones if they have the severe form of the disease. Problems that manifest in their heart, and later on also with their breathing too. You might have a stiff chest, overgrowth of your adenoids and your tonsils in your mouth. You might get some gag deposits in your larynx. MPS can make you feel very isolated. If you don't talk to other people who you know what you're going through, when you finally meet another family who's had that diagnosis as well, you don't have to explain anything. They know what it's like, they, they know the symptoms, they know the prognosis. And so meeting other families at MPS Society events, it's a bit of a lifeline, really. Gorgeous. Where are you? Ah! Oh, you can back that out. Go on then. Yeah. Oh, is it got to go back in? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. He's six now, which means that he should, in the normal course of things, be plateauing and starting eventually to lose skills. I don't think we've seen that. He's still slowly gaining things and he he can do things now that he wouldn't have been able to a year ago it used to be if you wanted him to get his coat you'd say danny where's your coat your coat look your coat that's it we'll get your coat whereas now you can say danny where's your coat and he can run and get it and that might not sound like much but it's massive for a child who's non-verbal. In the first few months when we were having treatments at hospital, ended up being 18 weeks of going to hospital every week and the nurses knew I was struggling and booked an appointment with the psychologist. And I sat down and 
he said, oh, here your son's got MPS2. Yes. And it's the severe version. Yes. That's really shit, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, yes. And he said, but, but you, you're doing it. You, you're managing. And I just, I told him that I didn't feel I was. And he said, but you are, you know, you're showered, you're dressed, you're feeding your kids, you're doing what has to be done. You haven't run away. <laughs> and I said I wanted to, because I did at times. Sometimes I just wanted to go out that door and walk away and just keep walking. Keep walking until there was no mention of MPS and nothing to deal with. But of course you can't. You can't. Oh no. Oh no. Hey. There we go. Good boy. We'll take that one here. <laughs> Good boy. Every week he has an enzyme replacement treatment. So that's putting a synthetic version of the enzyme that he's missing into his body. It means that his airways won't continue getting worse. His heart won't carry on building up the um, waste products. As a very simplistic view, it helps keep him alive. Gene therapy has been the magical promise sitting on the horizon. And watching the first trials, things like that happening, it's amazing. I mean, things that scientists can do now. So all of the hunters community is basically holding their breath. Gene therapy has the most capacity to be transformative you should see a really significant change in the lifestyle of these, uh, of these patients. And that's what we hope to be able to achieve in the next few years. It does take a long time to develop work from a preclinical stage into the clinic. Typically it's about 10 years. Even in this space where we don't have very many patients to treat, um, it can still be very slow. I think we're aware that it might not come early enough for Danny. But, you know, someday, someday somebody will be able to be told that their son has hunters. But told, don't worry, it's fine. There's something we can do about it. And that, that would just be amazing. Because that's the worst thing in the world is to be told that your son has this condition and there's no treatment. <laughs>